Good morning and welcome to this service of worship. My name is Jeffrey Leininger. I was pastor for more than 40 years at the Warren Point Presbyterian Church in Fairlawn. I'm able to be with you this morning as one of your worship leaders because of a formula of agreement between your denomination and mine that permits the uh, interchange of pastors. Personally, I consider this a milestone. Uh, it's the first time that I've ever preached and celebrated the Lord's Supper in a Lutheran church. So this will always be an important day for me. While this day is for me and chanting, I won't be chanting. So uh, the, in the communion part of the service, um, at the beginning of the great Thanksgiving, it will be spoken. Uh, the choir will be leading all of the musical responses. So if we may sing together our first hymn. Oh. 
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share Christ's peace one with another.
us pray. Creator God, you prepare a new way in the wilderness, and your grace waters our desert. Open our hearts to be transformed by the new thing you are doing, that our lives may proclaim the extravagance of your love given to all through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson is taken from Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribes of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to the zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the price of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negreb. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out with weeping carrying the seed will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. This is the word of the Lord. This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with Jesus. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, 
one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii, and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. At first, today's lesson from the Gospel according to John may be puzzling. It sounds familiar, but the the details don't seem quite right. Mary anoints Jesus' feet using perfume and wipes them with her hair. She is not a sinful woman, but the sister of Martha and Lazarus. But wasn't the woman who bathed Jesus' feet a sinner? According to Luke's Gospel, the story of the sinful woman who bathed Jesus' feet with her tears, dried them with her hair, and then anointed them with ointment happened much earlier during Jesus' earthly ministry. Okay. But I thought that the anointing of Jesus took place when a woman poured the ointment from an alabaster jar onto his head, which would have been the customary way to honor a guest. Matthew and Mark report the anointing of Jesus' head, but neither identifies the woman who did the anointing. Only the house in which the anointing took place was the house of Simon the leper. In our lesson this morning, the anointing takes place in Bethany as in Matthew and Mark's Gospels. The house is not identified, but the woman is, Mary. Martha is identified as serving the dinner. If this meal and this anointing were taking place in the house of Simon the leper, would Martha be serving the meal? Still other questions might be raised, but going any further, we may just resemble a dog chasing its tail. My intent is to clear the way for our appreciating this story for what it's worth, and it's worth a lot. To acknowledge the puzzlement to get it out of the way. If this is concerning to you, all these, are they discrepancies, are they different stories, whatever, I suggest that you raise the issue with Pastor Jay, but please don't tell him it was me who suggested that you do that. (laughs) A few years ago, I saw the rock and roll group, The Association, at the Newton Theater in northwestern New Jersey, at least the continuing members of the original lineup. Much to my disappointment during the show, 
one or more of them admitted that their song, Along Comes Mary, a song which I still enjoy every time I hear it, was in fact about marijuana. <laughs> Unlike that Mary, however, there is nothing disappointing about this Mary. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. Now, a Roman pound was 12 ounces, not 16 ounces like you were accustomed to. But still, this is an overwhelming, luxurious amount of perfume. She wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. That was just this side of risque. For a woman to appear in public with her hair unbound was considered, I think you understand. <laughs> Mary did not count the cost. There was no cost that was too high to honor Jesus. She extravagantly loved Jesus. Compare and contrast her with Judas, whose response to this loving spectacle was, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii? and the money given to the poor to help to appreciate the extravagance of this gift. Judas was suggesting that this, what he thought, wasted gift was worth a year's wages for a common laborer extravagant love, to say the least, which also points up, as you can well imagine, the depth of Judas' love for Jesus. But Mary humbly, extravagantly loved Jesus. She did not anoint his head, but his feet. Luke tells us that in Mary's first encounter with Jesus, she sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. When her sister Martha came and complained to Jesus that she was doing all the work and Mary was just sitting there, what did Jesus say? Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Not many days before Mary's humble, extra extravagant show of love for Jesus, her brother Lazarus fell ill. Martha and Mary sent for Jesus, but Jesus delayed. Lazarus died. While the Lord and his disciples were en route to Bethany, Martha came out to Jesus. Upon returning from her encounter with Jesus, she told her sister, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when Mary heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But Mary and the Jews who had followed her, and indeed Martha, all would witness the raising of Lazarus from the dead. 
Before that ever happened, Mary had acknowledged humbly that Jesus was her teacher. Jesus was her Lord. How much the more now? Mary's enacted love anticipates Jesus' enacted love. John reports that six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. If you are familiar with the events of Holy Week, you will no doubt remember that in John's Gospel, on Maundy Thursday, we read, and during supper Jesus got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, as a Presbyterian Reformed Christian, just like faithful Lutheran Christians, I believe in the full divinity of Jesus. And, like faithful Lutherans, I also believe in the full humanity of Jesus. To believe in the full humanity of Jesus is to believe that Jesus was the same in every respect as we are, but without sin. I wonder why the Lord chose to wash the disciples' feet in order to get his message across. What inspired him to undertake this humble gesture of love? Masters did not wash servants' feet. Did Mary's act of anointing his own feet just a few days before suggest to him that he might use the humble act of foot washing in order to get his message across to them. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? When Simon Peter would have prevented him, Jesus told him, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you, for he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. And of course, the ultimate expression of extravagant love of the love that counts no cost, the expression of no cost too high, was Jesus' death on the cross. In his letter to the church in Philippi, the Apostle Paul wrote, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Before this ultimate expression of humble, extravagant love, Jesus himself declared to his disciples, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. This morning we have looked at Mary and her humble, extravagant love. We have looked at Jesus and his acts of humble, extravagant love. As we prepare to receive the body of the Lord in this Holy Communion, there is yet one other person at whom we should look. You could see that one other person at whom we should look if you had 
a hand-held mirror. The one other person this morning that we should look at is each and every one of us. On the night of the Last Supper, Jesus gave his followers a new commandment, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So what about you? And what about me? To what can you point in your life as an example of humbly loving and serving someone else? To what can you point in your own life as an action in which you extravagantly loved someone else with no thought to the cost? with no expectation that you would receive anything in return. Think on those things. And as you do, remember that no one would know the story of the Good Samaritan if he only had good intentions. Amen. Let us sing our next hymn.
Together, let us express our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's return now to God in prayer for others. Please keep in your minds and hearts those people who are listed in the bulletin under the prayers of the church. Let us pray. Almighty God, who taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere, hear us as we pray for others, those who are printed in the bulletin, as well as those we name through the name of Jesus Christ. Inspire, we pray, the whole church with your power, unity, and peace. Grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. Lead all nations in the way of justice and goodwill. Direct those who govern that they may rule fairly, maintain order, uphold those in need, and defend oppressed peoples that this world may claim your rule and know true peace. Awaken all people to the danger we have inflicted upon your earth. Implant in each a reverence for all you have made, that we may preserve the delicate balance of creation for all coming generations. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and through deeds of mercy that by their teaching and example they may reveal your love for all people. Comfort and relieve, O Lord, all who are in trouble, sorrow, poverty, sickness, grief, especially those known to us whom we name before you in silence. Heal them in body mind or circumstance, working in them by your grace, wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. And bring to our remembrance all those who, having served you on earth, <coughs> now sing your praises eternally. May their endurance give us courage, their faithfulness give us hope, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty, merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so with all the choirs of angels and with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
we meet, till we meet, I'll learn all that Jesus said.